Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Um, this uh, forum for the mayoral candidates is a, an idea of, uh, well, certainly we, we talked about it in our class. It started out as something that would occur in the classroom, and as the students began to work on it and talk about it, why not a wider, wider audience? And, and so I, I think they've done a great job at building the event and getting the word out. We want to uh, specially thank Bonnie Roberts in the Ford School Communications Office for her work in helping to make this happen. I want to thank Close Up uh, for being one of our sponsors. And if you're in uh, Public Policy 456, 476, raise a hand just so that we have a few of them spread around and right up front. The students have done a great job. Now, they have developed uh, five questions, which we should take, depending on how long our candidates go on. It'll take, uh, they have two minutes, which will be explained to them. Um, that should take about 40 minutes. And then, uh, and then there will be an opening on the floor for more questions. And there's three students, raise your hand. In the, no, 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 right in the second row here. Uh, they will be taking the cards which you have available to you. And, and if you have a question, get it to them uh, quietly. And then we can uh, ask that question perhaps later on in the, in the event. Uh, in uh, public policy 456, 756, uh, students learn everything about city government. They delve deeply into the budget. They learn about the issues facing the city, the perennial issues and the issues du jour. They, they, we talk about affordable housing. Uh, we talk about a wonderful park system our city has. We, we talk about the fortunate condition of our city to be, to be in, in pretty good financial shape coming out of the Great Recession and how part of that has to do with how progressive cities that are part of the information and the creative economy are doing better than cities that are not part of that economy. So a lot of, of good information is covered in the class and, and, and the students uh, I think have done a great job this semester and a great job in putting this together. So they have developed the questions. Um, Isaac Epstein, Nick Frost, and, and Katie Hinson are gonna be our moderators today. I, I'm going to uh, take a seat in the back and turn it over to them. The council members will rotate, each of them taking a question first uh, and then moving on to the next one to take the question first and so on around the table. So uh, I will turn it over to Isaac, Nick, and Katie right now. Uh, and did, uh, just I wanted to repeat that if, in case I missed it. If uh, the, f the folks on the uh, Michigan Daily live stream, it's hashtag A2 Mayor Ford School if you want to tweet in a question. Hashtag A2 Mayor Ford School. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, the current mayor said that we had uh, five questions. We actually have six. Um, the first one though is kind of a freebie. Um, I have on my sheet, please take one minute to tell us about yourself. Just a quick introduction. Starting with you, uh, Sabra. Okay. Council member, councilman and I decided it was more comfortable to use the stand. So that's what we're going to do. Um, but. Uh, we may give up on that, you never know. My name is Sabre Briere. I sit on city council. I've been on council since 2007. I'm a neighborhood activist. That's what got me involved in politics and it's what I still am. I have a, a firm commitment to government that is from the people, not to the people. And so as a, a person who believes government comes from the, an educated and engaged populace, my task has always been to try to engage the people of Ann Arbor in what we're doing. I'm still trying to do that, and it's a challenge. This is an excellent way to do it, and I thank the class for hosting us, and I thank all of you out there for attending this class, because I think that we should all take some public policy classes from time to time. Um, I'm Stephen Councilman. I was recently elected elected, re-elected to my uh, fourth term on Ann Arbor City Council. Um, I grew up in Ann Arbor, graduated from Pioneer in 1981, uh, attended the University of Michigan, uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources in 1986, uh, spent the summer of 86 working for the City of Ann Arbor Forestry Department, um, and in 87 I was a driver for Recycle Ann Arbor briefly. Um, went back to grad school at the University of Michigan, got a Master's of Landscape Architecture, a Master's of Urban Planning, um, and from about 1992 to about 2000, to 2003, um, I worked in local government. 
Um, I served as an environmental planner for six years at Sumter Township, uh, which is the southwest corner of Wayne County, um, and then rose up to the ranks of township administrator. I worked for seven elected officials for over 10 years, and uh, I think that um, is really one of the highlights of my qualifications for running for mayor is that I know local government and I understand local government and I understand politicians and uh, what we can do and what we cannot do uh, within the limits of law. Local government is a book of rules and uh, I think it's really important that we abide by those rules. All right, we're going to try it this way. Okay, hi, I'm Sally Hart-Peterson. I'm on my first uh, term on Ann Arbor City Council. I've lived in Ann Arbor for almost 18 years. I moved here in the summer of 96 from Massachusetts, which is where I grew up. Um, I moved here with my husband, Tim, so he could attend the university, what was then called the University of Michigan Business School, and I had a five-week-old baby at the time. Um, as I said, I grew up in Massachusetts. Um, my undergrad degree is in psychology from Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And I have an MBA from Harvard Business School. So while I grew up and was educated in Massachusetts, most of my professional career has actually been in the Midwest. In between undergrad and graduate school, I worked for Cummins Engine Company in Columbus, Indiana. And then after business school, when I moved here with my husband, I actually had to go back to work full time, even though I had a baby. Um, and I worked for CFI Group, which was named for Klaus Fresnel International. Klaus Fresnel is a noted business school professor here. And I've worked for AB and Amro Mortgage Group, and most recently in the for-profit world, I worked for Health Media. Um, in 2007, I became a stay-at-home mom. My kids were approaching middle school years. <clears throat> so I became very involved in the community. Um, and. Uh, Work, did a lot of PTSO, PTO work, and then um, eventually decided, after a couple of years, I'd, I'd try to run for city council, and it's been a great experience. Thanks. Uh, I'm Christopher Taylor. Uh, I came to Ann Arbor uh, in 1985, and like many of us, uh, the you know for the university, but like many of us, you know, stayed because I ended up loving the city. Uh, I am a four-time graduate of the university, two bachelor's degrees, a degree in American history, and a degree in uh, in law from the law school here. Uh, I am a uh, lawyer. I work at a law firm of Hooper Hathaway downtown, where my uh, representation mostly focuses on uh, local individuals and local businesses. I have. Uh, Let's see, a uh, wife and two kids, they both go to the public schools at Tappan. I've been on city council for six years now, uh, in three terms, and my service on council has just been tremendous. I've enjoyed it wonderfully. The problems and challenges of government are, to me, intrinsically interesting, and I have enjoyed so much working with residents and colleagues on the problems and opportunities, uh, the problems that confront us and the opportunities that present themselves. Uh, I'm running for mayor. Uh, largely because uh, I love the city and because uh, the city is at an important time in its history and it's, I think, critical that the next mayor have the experience, temperament, and judgment to uh, work collaboratively with, uh, with residents and colleagues and staff, of course, to, uh, to work to improve and, and maintain the quality of life for everyone in the city. Uh, it's, uh, it's an important place, it's a special place, uh, and it deserves uh, that careful attention. I want to thank you all again for being here. Um, could you please tell me what traits you feel are necessary to be a successful mayor and how that relates to your personal leadership style? You have two minutes for each of these questions. Well, thank you. Um, First of all, I think you know experience certainly uh, does come into play, and I think that's why all of us, you know, are council members presently. We understand what it takes to run local government. Um, so I have, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I have a lot of experience working in local government. I have experience of working with staff, working with citizens, um, and then there's the issue of also being effective. And in order to be effective, you have to uh, be able to collaborate, obviously, with everyone, um, but you also have to have courage. You have to have courage to be able to stand up and take on uh, the uh, issues that might be uncomfortable. 
Um, you have to be able to take on issues that will generate anger uh, among certain people because they don't like the truth. And uh, you know, I think for my six years on council and for my over 10 years working in local government, I have shown that that ability. Um, of everyone here on council, I do have the most experience. I am the most experienced um, person working in local government and, uh, you know, and, and also serving on council. I'm not, not so much the tenure, I should say. Um, but then there's also the issue of ethics, okay? And that's where I think it's really important that, you know, we all strive to be very ethical when we are on council, but um, it's harder to be ethical in local government than to be unethical. And I think that's uh, the many years that I've served on council, I've always taken a much, uh, taken on the very uh, strong, hard challenges and uh, have been you know, pretty good at accomplishing those uh, tasks. I took on countywide transit. Uh, most recently, I spoke about the heroin use that's uh, permeating our downtown that we were not necessarily aware of. Um, I took on the taxi cab industry uh, when the rogue limos uh, were um, traveling around our town and uh, we had some issues with uh, students um, that were being uh, supposedly uh, sexually assaulted um, because they were unlicensed taxis. So I've taken on some issues, taken a lot of heat. Um, I think, but because of that, I'm still here. Um, and again, I've just been recently reelected to my fourth term. So while I may have less experience in local governance than some of the other candidates for mayor, I do have what I feel is a lot of relevant business leadership experience, professional leadership experience, as well as leadership in the community. I feel like, you know, I've been here 18 years. I know this community really well. I've been on the board of the neutral zone. I've been um, president of the PTO and PTSOs of my kids' um, elementary school, and also I'm a Tappan parent as well, or Tappan graduate parent, and been involved in the high school athletics as well. And so I feel like those experiences are very relevant to governing the city. I specifically think my business background, my MBA, and my training as an MBA allows me to approach the challenges the city faces from a very analytical perspective. I've always approached problem solving by looking at both sides of an issue before I make up my mind. It is so easy to be swayed by a vocal minority or by, and not so easy to be swayed by a silent majority. I always want to hear from the silent majority, but sometimes it's hard to, to uncover what, what's going on when you don't hear from people. Um, and so I've, you know, I feel like my training in business leadership, um, analytical approach to look at problems from a general management perspective, and I think that's directly um, translatable to the role as a mayor. Um, looking at the issues, looking at the city. Honestly, I think this city has what I would characterize as a business problem. I wouldn't try to run the city like I would run a business, but I do recognize that the city has a revenue problem. We're entering a period of great economic growth, yet our balance sheet is constrained. We've come out of a period of, of a decade of cuts, and I see growth is coming ahead of us, and I think we need a mayor who can translate that growth into better infrastructure and improvements for our taxpayers. Thanks. Uh, at the outset, in my first uh, statement I, uh, I referenced, uh, I think, you know, sort of foreshadowed the answer to this question, and that is uh, temperament, experience, and judgment. Uh, this is, I think, what a mayor uh, needs to succeed in the city. Uh, temperament. Uh, a mayor uh, needs to be able to uh, work well with others, needs to be able to collaborate, needs to be active in outreach, active in listening, uh, active in collaboration. Uh, this is uh, critical to uh, working effectively as a leader in a representative democracy. Uh, in a dictatorship, temperament is, uh, is, is less important to getting things done, but uh, where you have to uh, convince uh, colleagues and staff uh, and, and even sometimes residents to uh, uh, to, to get behind a common act, a program of common action and to yourself be willing to uh, make compromises in order to affect the public good. Uh, temperament is crucial. Uh, on council, I've been able to work, uh, work well, I believe, with colleagues and staff. And I've also taken affirmative outreach to residents. Uh, 
corresponding with, uh, with hundreds, thousands of them, uh, seeking their advice and counsel on issues of importance before the city. This is something I think that's terribly important uh, and is something that I would certainly continue to do as mayor. Uh, with respect to experience, uh, I've been on council for six years and uh, lived through uh, the Great Recession, which was certainly a testing time for any elected official. Uh, that is the worst. Uh the worst time of our city I certainly hope to ever experience. Uh, we uh, went through quite a lot. It required a laser-like focus on what is core and important to the city. And uh, I would uh, expect that experience to serve me well moving forward. And finally, judgment. Uh, it is uh, crucial to listen. It is crucial to uh, educate yourself and others, but ultimately a mayor uh, will need to make a decision that is in the best interest of the long term, uh, in the long term best interest of the city, and um, it's important that the mayor uh, keep that lodestar in mind. I'm sitting quietly over here, uh, so Sally sort of forgot I was here. Sorry. I don't want you all to forget I'm here, though, because what you've heard is, is all our credentials. And uh, honestly, we're a sterling bunch of folk. But when we talk about temperament or judgment or all the other things, I, I want to also talk about independence. So. It's easy to talk politics in this world, and sometimes it's a lot of fun to watch politics happen. My task on council has not been to be part of a group, or two groups, or anything else. It's actually been to make up my own mind. That isn't without consultation. Um, when I got on council, I was the first council member to actually actively reach out to the community routinely and ask for advice, comment, input. I meet with my constituents every week. I hold office hours, but I also meet with them whenever it's more convenient for them. This lets me touch what they're concerned about, which is so important to me, because it's easy for me to tell them what's on the agenda and for them to respond to the issues I highlight. It's much more valuable to me to hear the issues that they're concerned about. I listen actively, not just to the people on council, not just to the people on staff, but to everyone I can. And the end result of that is I learn from every person who touches me. Being on council, being mayor, these take temperament. It takes a passion for government. It takes a commitment to being calm in the storm. Those are things that I bring with me. But it also takes a willingness to admit you're wrong. And that's something that I am free to do and do when I realize that I made up my mind too early. Um, so our next question is sort of directly related to students in the audience. We are wondering um, how you feel that the city can work to increase student involvement in local elections, politics, and government. Thank you. Um, I think any question about town-gown relationships really interests me. It's something that I've been working um, to improve um, very early when I started for running for city council two years ago. Um, getting students involved, um, first of all, it's incumbent upon people in city council, I think, to search out opportunities with students. I spoke actually last September to the central student government, and it was a wonderful experience. I've been in other meetings of town-gown kind of relationship when we talk about um, life on campus and life uh, for off-campus living, students who are living off-campus, and some of the challenges that uh, that presents for the community. It, I represent Ward 2, which is adjacent to, which includes a lot of the fraternity houses, and so we hear a lot of some of the town-gown issues. But getting students involved 
in city governance, I think is something that there's a lot of room for improvement. And I think one of the things that we really need to focus on is trust in governance and open and transparent communication. One of the things, um, Council Member Councilman mentioned city, mentioned ethics. Um, one of the things that um, I've tried to so, show some leadership in, in in city council is taking the first steps toward developing a city ethics policy. And the city, I'm working right now with the city attorney to develop standards for, um, to develop training for standards of conduct and um, conflict of interest policy. And so I think once we're able to clarify some of the transparency issues, then people feel more welcome to, be, to become more engaging in civic activities and to involve students in the workings of the city governance as well. Thanks. Students will be involved in things that interest them and that they believe have a material impact on their lives. Uh, I think it is uh, important and useful for the city government and for the, the mayor to communicate uh, to students that the city has an, does play this important role in their, in their lives while they're here in town, whether they choose to stay or, or whether they're just here for their degree. Uh, they're obviously, while they're here uh, and living in campus and focused on campus, there are questions of neighborhood, uh, neighborhood security and maintenance. There's issues of, uh, of you know, personal safety with respect to police and fire. And also, uh, as many of them are renters, there's also insurance uh, uh, points of interaction with respect to you know, the inspection of rental properties. Uh, these are areas uh, where where you know, students uh, should know what the city does for them and with them and should be able to participate in, uh, in, in, in helping. Uh, on some level, uh, I think the, uh, what the city should do and ought to do is uh, talk to students about uh, why Ann Arbor is a great place and why they should be interested in civic life while they're here and hopefully while they stay. Uh, it's so important to Ann Arbor's future that young people find Ann Arbor to be an attractive, vital place to, uh, to come to the university, but also, more importantly, for my purpose, uh, to stay and build a life, whether it's uh, as a, a young a professional or a young person uh, with a family. Uh, this is critical to Ann Arbor's future. I think the city government has a role uh, in communicating that uh, to, uh, to students. I think it's important, too, that, you know, you know, they can be communicated all they want, uh, but if the downtown is not vibrant and active, if there are not uh, cultural and dining entertainment opportunities uh, for young people, if transit is not uh, fully implemented so that they can get around without a car, uh, these are things that, uh, that students and young people want in a city, uh, and it is uh, the city's obligation to work to deliver it. So, of course, it's not about us involving you all in local politics. About, it's about you all getting involved in local politics. And students are not kept out. Students may not be invited in enough. And part of that is that you don't see the relevance of local politics as a student. As I have a clear memory that what I focused on was national politics and international politics. I cared about foreign wars. I cared about uh, whether or not the Congress could reach a decision. I cared about what the president said. But it took me a while to realize that I should care about what was going on here. How are students engaged already in local politics? There's a, a large number of students working on environmental issues. They're working on those environmental issues with the city. There's a, another number of students working to help plan the Allen Creek um, trail system. Their class has taken that on and they are working with the city and they're working with residents. These are opportunities that students like you, like the people who may or may not ever watch this show, actually take advantage of. And that's what we want. There are students who are engaged in attending council meetings, attending board and commission meetings, um, reaching out and talking with members of the community to find out everything from the things that to me are obvious, like how does our recycling system work, to what do I do to get this house that I live in inspected because it's really in bad shape. Our task is to 
welcome that involvement, but also to think about the future of the city. Like everyone else here, including Councilmember Kunzelman, at some point I made a decision to be here. And having made that decision that this was where I was going to live, I dug in and I learned how the community worked. What made me make that decision was it's my perception that it was a tolerant, open, exciting, interesting place that respected education and respected my ability to do those things. Our task is to do that for you. As mayor, that's what I will be doing. I have probably the most seasoned candidate when it comes to elections, uh, having just been in five primary elections, um, all contested. Uh, my last general election, I was contested by a student, and we had a really good time. Um, but this question comes up at almost every election that I've been in. And I look at it in a number of different ways, but one of which is the students can, as I think Councilmember Rear uh, pointed out, students have a responsibility to get engaged if they want to participate. All right, It's not our responsibility to uh, grab their hand and pull them in. It's their responsibility to come and, and ask and, and to participate. Um, and they do when they want to. Uh, so for example, I serve on the taxi cab board and we have students serving on the board uh, with me. Um, and they showed up at meetings, at council meetings. They showed an interest, okay? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And that's the same thing for students. Having been a student as well as a townie uh, in Ann Arbor, um, I think in the past, I remember our city government providing internships for students. Um, I was an intern on the city forestry department when uh, the first summer that I graduated with my undergraduate degree. We had a robust forestry department. We no longer have that. And I know that we do hire summer workers for our pools and in our park system, but not to the extent that we did in the past. And I think that's one of the things that I would do as mayor is to try to, to uh, promote that kind of um, opportunity uh, to engage students into our local government. Because when you have that experience, when you work in the public sector and you feel good for working for the public, that will be an, an experience that you'll be able to take anywhere, okay? And it was an experience that I took. And basically, I've been working in the public sector since I was in, uh, since 1986. Um, and can still to this day, because now I presently work for the university, which is still the public sector. Um, but students have a, a responsibility as well as the public. And so just to follow up on that, the chair of the county commission, Yusef Rabi, is a longtime family friend, and he was a student when he helped me on my campaign, and he's now an elected official. So I think it again, it shows that students can do it, and uh, they can do it if they have the desire. Uh, so we've had a question related to this on Twitter. Um, uh, we've had a couple of people ask if you would be in support of moving the primary from August to a time when there might actually be some students in town. So can we just get a show of hands? How many of you would be willing to support that? I believe there are state law issues as to when primaries can be held. So it, we could do that if we didn't ha hold the elections in November. We can't do it because we do hold the elections in November. It's not a choice. Okay, so the next question is, um, uh, currently about 40% of those receiving shelter services in Ann Arbor are not residents of Washtenaw County. What do you think Ann Arbor can do to ensure that we are prioritizing services for county residents before serving what is clearly a greater regional need? Can we start with Councilman Taylor? Thanks so much, that's a great question. Um, when the Delana Center was built, uh, the Delana Center was uh, built for the purpose of providing uh, uh, residential residential services to folks who are homeless uh, in Washtenaw County. Uh, at the time, much fewer than the 40% figure that you've just cited uh, were, or, were served. The reason why that has increased is because of the diminution of need throughout the rest of the region, but also because of the state's uh, up, uh, requirement that in order to receive a certain amount of money that the Delana Center serve out of county residents. If we're going to be able to ourselves distinguish between in-county and out-of-county residents uh, in the provision of residential services and indeed in the provision of warming, uh, evening warming services, uh, we'll need to either renounce the state money through uh, 
the public sector or perhaps enhanced grants from the city and the county uh, or uh, you know, seek to uh, find those funding sources elsewhere. Uh, so what can we do about it? We will need to uh, replace state funding for the Delana Center if we are to address that issue. It's an important one. I think it's a conversation that we very much need to have. Uh, the folks uh, right now, you know, I've talked to folks down at the, at the center. Uh, Church buses from out of the county bring, uh, bring folks in need of services to the center for warming and for residential. And it breaks your heart because there's no other place in their local communities to, uh, to receive these services. And so they're brought here. This is, uh, it's good that w these services are available, but it is a real strain and it is contrary, I think, to the intent of the center and the intent of the uh, ongoing local funding for the center that these services be provided to um, to non-county residents. It's not contemplated that anyone would be turned away in the dead of night. That will never happen. If you're out of county and you need a place to be uh, warm in the winter, uh, you, will be, you would be uh, here and you would be served. Uh, it would be contemplated, however, that the next day uh, efforts would be made to work on uh, finding you alternate services uh, in your home jurisdiction. This is... Uh an interesting question, but it's perhaps the wrong question. It's the wrong question because it focuses on the people who live outside of Washtenaw County, as if somehow they were the set thieves who are taking our valuable services. What they are is people who are hungry and homeless and without services in their home communities. The challenge we face is twofold. Councilmember Taylor is completely correct. We would have to reject state money in order to reject providing services for all comers. But we also have to question whether the services that we currently provide meet the needs of the community, whether um, providing a very small center, which is what Delanus is, it was intended to house no more than 50 people. It now houses 75. And in cold weather, it has to provide a warming service for whoever shows up, which means everyone becomes increasingly uncomfortable and, frankly, uh, dissatisfied with the services they're receiving. Um, is this the model that we want to follow? Is this what our community wants? This, we haven't had that discussion, but we need to. We also need to talk about the fact that providing funds for those who need them used to be something that our tax dollars went to Lansing and came back to us to do. They don't anymore. Increasingly, the city is more on its own than it used to be. It's also receiving increasingly less money. The city and the county are receiving increasingly less money from the federal government to provide services for the hungry and the homeless. It's our challenge. But it's a challenge that every community in Michigan should be picking up and not leaving it to our fate to deal with. Ann Arbor does care about the people who have needs, but it's not going to be able to do this in isolation. It's a regional issue. It's not a local issue. And those who think that all the hungry and the homeless live in Ann Arbor are wrong. We have to tackle this on a regional basis. Yeah, there is no easy answer. You know, it's almost like asking uh, the state if they would put restrictions on the state appropriation to the University of Michigan to only in-state residents. All right, as we've watched the U of M go from uh, a large percentage of in-state residents almost down to, what, 53%. You know, there's a tie. There's no tie to the university. So why is there a tie uh, from state funding to the, for our efforts to, to provide uh, housing for the homeless? Um, so I think you know we're we're kind of hamstrung there. Our hands are tied behind our backs because when you accept those dollars, obviously they come with conditions. Um, but what we also need to think about is that we can't just keep pumping money to downtown Ann Arbor, the Delana Center. We need to start thinking about diversifying sites. We need to start thinking about out county areas. All right, there is no homeless shelter in the Ypsilanti area. Um, why are there other communities not able to uh, help support? 
um, those efforts. You know, Ann Arbor, uh, as Mayor John Heafta has pointed out many times, is that Ann Arbor is one of maybe one, two, or three communities in the state that actually provides general fund dollars towards uh, this effort, um, Health and Human Services. Um, and it's a very constrained budget, um, and it's not an easy answer for us to engage with. Um, I don't, as Councilmember Breer pointed out, I don't think it's right for us to turn people away just because they live somewhere else. Ann Arbor is a community of immigrants, all right? Almost everybody comes here from somewhere else. My grandparents came here from Adrian and Blissfield back in the 50s. Um, others come from other communities. Um, but Ann Arbor has a value of at least doing what we can and doing the best we can uh, to support the, the, those in need. Um, but it's not an easy uh, answer, um, or it's not gonna be easily solved. And, uh, but the best thing we can do is just keep plugging away at it. Yeah, I have to agree that, you know, Ann Arbor is a transient community. We have people coming in and coming out all the time. And in the spirit of inclusion, you know, I would, if I were mayor of this city, I would never want to turn anyone away, whether we had state funding or not. Um, one of the things I've been very pleased about um, our, our council legislation recently, we've attributed a lot more money to affordable housing. And I think that's, that's an important thing that we should keep doing. Um, but funding services isn't, is only one solution. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time in the last couple of months, a couple of visits over to um, the new Mission House on Stone Street, on uh, Stone, Stone, School. Stone, Stone School Road, it's a mouthful. Um, and one of the things that I learned is that there is a group of people who actually don't qualify for affordable housing, not because they're low income, but because they're zero income. And what I think the source of a lot of the problem is really mental illness and addiction. And those are things that we need to start treating um, and find resources at the federal and state level as well as the local level. Um, the people that live at Mission House or are former residents of Camp Take Notice have a hard time, frankly, finding jobs, either because of their, their addiction issues or because of past felonies. Um, and so they're hard to be employed, and they're hard to be able to find an income and therefore qualify for affordable housing. So I think the solution is to work together with our state and federal counterparts to really focus on how we solve the problem of mental illness, as well as how do we help those people find jobs that they can um, become part of the affordable housing programs as well. Um, finally, I think, you know, specific to the Mission House, there, it's, it's an agenda item in our planning commission right now. I think the city needs to think very creatively about how we can zone that so we can um, encourage more people to live there. Thank you very much. I'm clearly not very good at using the microphone here. Thank you. Um, thank you for your answers and your responses. Um, at this time, I would like to invite any members of the community who have written down questions on our note cards um, to hold them up so that our bachelor students can come and collect them for you. <laughs> yes, they are very eligible. The <laughs> bachelor. Uh, our next question on economic growth. With several years of significant downtown development, do you feel there is still a need to increase de development downtown and the density? Why or why not? I don't think, no, I don't think I have a microphone that's working. Let's see. Okay, this one works. Um, I don't think that the, that's a perfect question either, and part of it's because it implies that we should stop having changes downtown because we're satisfied with all the changes that have happened. I don't think that is ever going to be the case. Um, our downtown is thriving and interesting. Um, there's a lot more people on the sidewalk than there were 10 years ago. 
there's a lot more activity after seven o'clock at night on a Tuesday than there was 10 years ago. There's been a lot of change, but I think the, the upside of that change has been that there's a lot more interesting activities for people to do. Those activities couldn't be supported by Ann Arbor's residents alone. Those activities require that people come in from out of the city. We could, I suppose, uh, try to become a sleepy downtown again, but part of our efforts is have been to have a vital, exciting downtown that people want to come to. To cut that off and say no more development downtown does seem um, short-sighted to me. The real issue is, is it the right kind? Is it giving us what we want? Are we benefiting as a community? Or is it just growth for the sake of growth? And so that requires planning and thought. It also requires a certain level of leadership and a conviction that you understand what downtown should be. Downtown is not going to serve our wants, our, our needs anymore. It's not going to provide a grocery store. It's not going to provide a, a, a big parking lot for us to park whenever we choose for free. It's not that kind of downtown, and it shouldn't be. Because all the things I need, I can buy elsewhere, and many of them I buy electronically. So does everybody else in our community. Downtown is about providing us with our wants, the things we want to do, the things we want to see, the experiences we want to have. If we don't clue into what those wants are, downtown will fail. And because, frankly, we're all a little fickle when it comes to what we want, there has to be an opportunity for something new to arrive that we want. Whether they're, that's for us as individuals who live in this town or it's for our guests from out of the city. Downtown should change. It should grow. It should provide us with an interesting place. But it should not fail to provide us with places to rest. And that's why there's been so much discussion about a downtown park. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, that question kind of belies the thought that city council controls development when in fact we don't. We just uh, approve the rules, all right? And we did just change the rules for downtown zoning, hence to make it easier for uh, downtown development of bigger buildings. Um, but what drives our development downtown, okay? I would say it's been student housing, okay? If you look at the change in U of M enrollment since 2000 when we had 38,000 students to 2013 where we now have 43,710 students, that's a change of almost 5,600 students. And that means they need beds to sleep in and that's what's been built. There's a lot of new downtown student housing. I've, grew up in, I've grown up in Ann Arbor with a lot of change. I remember in the 70s when basically nothing was going on, the 80s was office buildings, um, the 90s, you know, condos, condos um, and now student housing, all right, the big jump in student housing, all right. But there's been no new office buildings basically built downtown. There is no new 1 North Main. There is no 301 East Liberty. Those were done in the 80s, all right. So in our city population, you know, back in 2000 was 114,000, and in 2012 it's estimated to be 116,000. So our population as a whole is not changing much other than students. And that's what's been driving Ann Arbor, you know. And that's been one of the concerns I have. Ann Arbor's become more of a company town under the guise of the University of Michigan. They've been buying up more land, taking it off the tax rolls. They are, uh, you know, increasing their enrollment. And if they continue with that trend, yes, downtown is going to be more student housing because that's where the action is. We all know that we want to be downtown uh, to go to the restaurants. But if you look at the change, as Councilmember Beer spoke about, there's no retail, there's no department stores, there's no bookstores to speak of. It's all turning into restaurants to feed students. But what happens in the summertime? Easily 30,000 students leave. And that's a lot of restaurants that are going to be struggling to find a clientele. So I think. Um, you know, we've done everything we can as a council. We just have to guide that growth with our rules, our zoning, and uh, hope for the, that the community and the university will restrain itself because this is a finite resource. Can you read the question one more time? With several years of significant growth downtown, do you still feel there is a need to increase development and density? I'm gonna focus a little bit more on 
the impending economic growth and relate it to downtown. Um, growth is happening, and we've heard that property values in Ann Arbor have increased over 6%. We've heard that 12,500 jobs are going to be coming to the county in the next three years. Um, I want those jobs to come to Ann Arbor. Um, but we need to make sure that we have the infrastructure to support those jobs, whether they come downtown or they come to the business corridors. One of the things, well, one of the things that City Council has 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 said in the last two years in our um, breakout groups is that economic health is a priority. But I quickly found out that in our city budget, we have no staffing or funding specifically or solely dedicated to economic development. The county does have economic development. The DDA does economic development, but they do it just for the downtown. Spark does economic development, but they do it for the county. So I took some leadership here and I formed the Economic Development Collaborative Task Force with the DDA and Spark to figure out what should the priorities be to take care of the whole city with regard to economic growth and economic development. And one of the things that we realized is that, yes, the, the downtown is thriving. Um, it's a wonderful place to eat, work, and play. The downtown belongs to everybody, um, students, millennials, um, empty nesters, families, and visitors. Um, and we need to keep it. We need to make sure that it continues to thrive. But I, I also look at the business quarters. I look at North Main Street, and I see that it's very underdeveloped. It's kind of an eyesore if you're coming from M14 heading to downtown. And I see that as ripe for opportunity with the right kind of economic policies to stimulate development where we could grow more, um, where we could develop it for multi-use, to have more office space, to have condos, and really make that area more symbiotic with the river uses as well. Thank you. Uh, Downtown density and activity downtown is good for everyone. Uh, it is good for the environment, it's good for the economy, and it's good for, uh, for neighborhoods, for people who live near downtown and, uh, and indeed who are, uh, are, are excited about the vitality that the downtown has to offer. Uh, we now have uh, you know, jobs coming to downtown. We have a new tech corridor on Liberty and State. Uh, this is absolutely outstanding for, for downtown's future. Uh, and downtown density, uh, the growth of uh, residential, the growth of business, uh, the growth of, uh, you know, retail, uh, literati, uh, and the, you know, the growth of the restaurant entertainment sector is, uh, is all good. At the same time, uh, we need to understand that Ann Arbor has a particular character, uh, and that character uh, can't be lost because it is important to who we are. Uh, it's not sufficient, and it's not uh, immutable. But at the same time, it is something that we need to recognize and honor and preserve. Uh, we need a downtown that is moving forward. Uh, the math uh, requires that there be downtown development, and that downtown development will be, uh, broadly speaking, a, a benefit because it will increase economic opportunity uh, and increase vitality and encourage people to come uh, and stay and enjoy our, our wonderful city. But the downtown needs to be uh, needs to be a downtown that we all uh, that we all recognize. It's the job of uh, of the council and city government, and of course the mayor, to work to preserve that balance, to make sure that uh, that the change that inevitably comes uh, does not come at the expense of what we treasure about the place. Microphones are a great idea. Okay. There we go. Um, all right, so this will be the last question from our little panel of people up here. So if anyone from the audience has additional questions they want to pass down, now is the moment. Um, we were wondering what you think the role of the mayor is in promoting public transportation locally, and what are the potential economic considerations and outcomes? You're next. Well, that's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> because you use the word locally, all right? And as mayor, I think it's important that we stay focused on mass transit serving the masses. As I opened up in my opening comments, I was one of the uh, 
few council members originally to um, speak out against the countywide transit effort that was being uh, led because that was basically sending, you know, the idea of sending shuttle buses out past cornfields to Chelsea and to Canton um, to provide transportation for commuters that lived in wealthier communities, communities than Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor does a very good job at supporting its transit system because we have a perpetual millage, right? We're one of the few communities probably in the state that has a millage that provides for mass transit. I would reckon to say that we probably have a better mass transit system than the city of Detroit because our buses run on time. I would also suggest that we need to uh, you know, support that. It, it all ties into the downtown density. It ties into economic development. And it certainly ties into um, assisting those of lower in, uh, incomes. I represent the side of town that has probably the largest geographic area of low to moderate family incomes over by Packard and Platt. And transportation is extremely important. All right, I advocated for a change in a route that gave us the Packard Road Express, all right, so that people can get downtown about 10 minutes faster than they could with the other routes that were taking them out, uh, out past Ellsworth or over to Briarwood first. Um, as mayor, you know, again, we need to support local transit. We need to make it so that it's making sense. And we have to have trust in the system because that's one of the things that we found is that when we start talking about trains to Howell and Brighton to communities that have no interest in helping to pay for it, or commuter rail to Detroit, when we have a uh, city of Detroit went from two million people down to less than 700,000 or so, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to a broader range of people. In order to support local transit, we have to have lots of trust among the electorate, among those that are paying the bills to help fund it, okay? Because you gotta remember, not everybody rides the bus, all right? Only probably, what, less than 20% of the people are actually using mass transit on a regular basis, but yet we all need to help pay. So as mayor, I would, and as a city council member, I, I do have the perspective that uh, a robust transportation system is key to have a strong economy in Ann Arbor. Um, I think that almost goes without saying. But as mayor, I, and again, as a city council member, I look at transportation as one of those quality of life issues that is of mutual benefit between the city and the University of Michigan. And, and I know as Jim Kostiva is in the audience here, Director of Community Relations, we've had a few, um, we've had some dialogue about the connector study and what that means to U of M uh, students, faculty, staff, and what that means to the city. And it's something that I think we need to explore cautiously together in terms of what that means to providing a robust transportation system. Again, a piece of quality of life that's of mutual benefit to both the university and the city. Um, I also want to speak a little bit as a resident um, on May 6th. I'm going to go to the polls and I'm going to vote either for or against the transit millage. And, um, and I, I want to be clear about how I feel because, um, and I, I'm saying, I'm leaning towards supporting it right now, um, but I'm a little bit still on the fence. The reason why I would support the millage for the expansion of the five-year plan is because I do believe um, in the first place that urban core and, and making the connection between Ypsilanti, Ipsy Township, and the city um, easier and expanding those routes so we have fewer um, Fewer cars on the streets, it's better for the, for the roads, it's better for the environment, and it leaves more parking spaces for Ann Arborites downtown. I also think we need a robust transportation system to help those who can't drive, those who are, el who are elderly or have disabilities, and I think we need to expand services for that. Um, but I live in a ward where there's quite a bit of opposition to the transit millage, and on April 29th, um, Councilmember Lum and I are hosting a Ward 2 meeting, and we'll hear from the AATA, and I want to hear from the opposition. I want to hear how the ride leadership is going to respond to some of the opposing questions from my ward before I endorse. Thanks. Uh, as mayor, it will be, uh it is the mayor's task, I believe, to advocate for public transportation. Uh, public transportation is an unalloyed good. It is good for the economy. It is good for the environment. Uh, it's good for the residents' quality of life, whether you're a senior, whether you're a student, uh, whether you're uh, a worker without a car, whether you would uh, never drive a bus and never ride a bus in a million years. Uh, the decreased uh, congestion, the decreased parking, it is an unalloyed good. Uh, and I think it is the mayor's obligation to, uh, to advocate for it. Uh, I believe that the, uh, 
the, since the millage has been raised, I believe that more buses more often is, uh, is a good, uh, and I am a hearty uh, supporter uh, of the upcoming uh, millage. I believe that the five-year plan proposed by the AAATA is going to expand services uh, in Ann Arbor for Ann Arbor uh, and will serve our community uh, ably and nobly. I think also the mayor has a role in, uh, in, in uh, supporting and moving forward the conversation about expanded rail service to the city. Uh, expanded rail is something that Ann Arbor's future requires. It requires better uh, transit between uh, major cities, uh, better, Amtrak, better Amtrak service to the city, and I believe uh, in order to uh, you know, optimize our potential, we're going to need uh, commuter rail to the city. Uh, folks from the, from the west, from the north, coming into town, uh, not driving, coming into employment centers, this is, uh, this is great for us all, and we should do everything we can to support it. Uh, there's been some question and controversy about where a potential station might go, how it might be funded. Uh, there's a study undergoing right now for my part. Uh, I am, uh, I am open to where the station lies. The federal government is telling us where they believe the optimal location of the station to be. Uh, I'm not an engineer. I'm listening to the traffic engineers. I listen to expertise. Uh, when that space is identified, when the federal government says, we will help you pay for a station at this location, uh, provided that the financing all works, and of course it's going to be done at the time, and we'll see what the ultimate plan will be, the introduction of meaningful rail to our city is going to be a, uh, a watershed moment for us. And I believe it is the mayor's uh, duty and obligation to advocate for it. On council, I'd just say what he said and, and let it lie because he's right. It is the mayor's obligation to advocate for public transit. But there's more than that. Public transit is not a local issue. Public transit is a regional issue. It's about people coming to Ann Arbor, people leaving Ann Arbor. It's about the relationships between the various communities in Southeast Michigan. And it's about the fact that some of us don't live right next door to where we work or where we want to go out to eat or where we want to go to the theater or the opera or the museums. The more we can provide alternative transportation to the people who live in our community for their use as they leave our community, the better service we're doing for everyone. If that also means that the people who live outside our community have better transit here to come to work, to come to eat, to come to play, to come to the museum, to go down the Huron River in a canoe, to rent a bike, well, this is also a real good, a true good that we should be embracing it is the mayor's obligation to see the big picture, to look at the entire issue from 360 degrees, maybe 720 degrees, because you should look at it from the top and the bottom and all sides. And then, if you can't support transit, then there's something really seriously wrong. Now, one of the issues that's come up is about trust. Trust between governmental organizations, and trust is something you build by positive relationships. You don't build it by just assuming it's there. You have to actually work at it. It requires talking, listening, collaborating, arguing, changing, moderating, in order to develop enough trust that each governmental unit can work together, whether it's the University of Michigan, AAATA, the county, or MDOT. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, there we go. That didn't take too long. Um, our next question comes from Twitter. Um, uh, in December of 2012, the city council passed a uh, ambitious climate action plan. Uh, do you think that the climate action plan is feasible and realistic and what will be your priorities in reducing emissions and promoting resiliency as mayor? First. Yeah, I think um, some of our activity, first of all, it was the right thing obviously to pass the climate action plan. Um, but as we move forward and we look at how we reinforce that through clean energy, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, 
how we prioritize that, we have to remember, you know, we have two sort of somewhat mutually exclusive goals. On the one hand, um, we all want to be clean and green and have clean energy, but it is more expensive energy. The other hand, we need to be fiscally responsible as well. And there was also a vote last fall about, for example, that we should recommend to the pension board that we divest from fossil fuel companies. And I actually was one of two people who voted against that because I felt like it was sending the wrong message. It would have been purely a symbolic message to the, to the pension board. It would not have done any damage to the fossil fuel companies. Um, but it would have been fiscally irresponsible because if they had taken us up on that recommendation, we would have um, incurred quite a few exorbitant charges to an underfunded pension to an underfunded pension board. So what I had actually recommended is to do both, is that, and, I, and I've asked the Energy Commission to come back to council with a rec recommendation not to divest from fossil fuels, but to invest in clean energy, like wind companies. I think we need to do both. I think the best way to go forward and to support the Climate Action Plan is to keep both of those objectives, wanting to be clean, have clean energy, but also being fiscally responsible. I think we need to do both, but we need to be very cautious about how we move forward. Thanks. Uh, the Climate Action Plan is ambitious and very long-term and aspirational, um, and I'm delighted that we have, uh, have passed it. Um, what the city, I think, needs to do is uh, undertake, you know, short immediate steps and keep working toward, uh, toward towards longer goals uh, immediately. Uh, we can, I believe, advocate for an expansion of the PACE program. The PACE program uh, assists uh, currently businesses uh, in um, rendering, making their homes, pardon me, making their buildings uh, more energy efficient. Uh, this is something that, uh, through this particular program, is excellent for, uh, for businesses and commercial enterprises. We want, need to expand it. Uh, I need to work also to work with our legislators uh, to make it available to local residents. Uh, we also, I think, need to seriously explore things such as uh, community solar to encourage uh, the use of uh, community farms, uh, solar farms to expand renewable energy even in sunny, uh, sunny Ann Arbor. Uh, we also have an opportunity, I believe, uh, you know, the city has done a great deal on its own for, affordable, for renewable energy. But so much of, uh, of the city's carbon footprint you know, is, uh, is in the residential sector, is with uh, the populace. Um, and the city doesn't have, obviously, direct control. It doesn't affect building codes or things like that. But what the city can do is it can educate and advocate. Uh, and it needs staff in order to do that. There was a request from the Energy Commission for the, uh, the council to move forward to invest in a staff member to advocate and educate the public about how they can best conserve energy, how they can best utilize renewable energy. I'm delighted to uh, support that. I believe that uh, this is something that is a public good that we, uh, we need to do for ourselves, we need to do uh, for, our, uh, you know, for, for the people that will follow us. Working on this issue is of vital importance. Uh, we can't do it without resources. And so I believe that the city ought to uh, spend, uh, spend some money to get it done. The Climate Action Plan is just one component of our uh, serious efforts with the environment. Um, climate Action deals with an encouragement of alternative fuel sources, but we have other efforts going on. I think it's important to note that the University of Michigan students collaborating with the City of Ann Arbor staff have worked together to create um, a program for rental housing where uh, rental property owners can receive a loan, invest that loan in their building, upgrade the energy systems, whether it benefits the resident or it benefits the landlord. Whoever pays for the power is no longer relevant. And then as the property owner pays back the city, it's paid back with interest and it's available to reinvest in the next property. It's an excellent idea and it's something that was done with collaboration between the city and the university. There's also the PACE program, which was originally intended to provide support for property owners 
single family homeowners to invest in their properties and, and pay back the investment. But um, because of problems with at the federal level that has not moved forward with residential properties, it has moved forward with commercial properties, including large commercial landlords. So those are things that are going on now. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are not taking advantage of the PACE program, and that's too bad. There's also a variety of opportunities to really look, again, at who uses energy. The University of Michigan's been a very responsible partner, but it is primarily something that we spend time on looking at residential properties in the city. The city has no program to help fund the cost and maintenance for solar power on individual properties. And that's something that I have been advocating for on the Environmental Commission and will continue to advocate for as mayor. I think we really need to have zoning and organization and funding uh, supports available for property owners who choose to invest in passive solar or other forms of alternative energy. Um, you know, I, I think we all recognize that the Climate Action Plan is a, a statement of values of the city of Ann Arbor, something that, you know, uh, we have held for many, many years, probably going all the way back to the 70s with the big environmental movement. Um, and the city's taken a lot of steps, and I think those steps should be continued. I mean, we look at our transportation, our fleets, you know, we have trucks that run on natural gas. We have um, the bike share program that the city's partnering with uh, the C the CSC and the university uh, should be implemented. We have, uh, you know, LED pedestrian lights, LED street lights, all of which need to be expanded upon, and I think I would continue with those efforts. You know, those are things that we can do as the city as itself. Um, we've been trying to work with wind energy, and we take a lot of flack for trying to promote uh, wind energy in the city of Ann Arbor because a lot of people think that it's not worth the money, um, but yet we still try. Um, we also, you know, with the city energy office, uh, you know, the idea that we can operate our buildings with energy efficiency um, is really important. And again, I think I would reckon to say that we're one of the few communities that actually has, you know, an energy staff person uh, to serve with the energy commission. But there is more to be done when it comes to distributed energy sources. And you know whether or not we can get more solar panels uh, on our buildings as we've done with the farmer's market. Um, there's an upcoming uh, uh, um, reception for the solar panels that have been put on the uh, Michigan theater. Um, but all of these things are actually very important to me because my job at the University of Michigan is energy conservation liaison. I work in the energy management office for the University of Michigan promoting energy conservation as a, uh, for our students, faculty, and staff because every little thing that you can do to uh, turn off uh, the energy consumption is money saved and less carbon um, emissions. And so I think it's important and we will continue to do so. I think all of us will continue to do so to promote those values that are uh, uh, held into the Climate Action Plan. Thank you. Um, our final question for the day. Um, what is one policy that the outgoing mayor's administration passed that you would like to see changed under your administration? <laughs> You know, it's back on. You know, I guess I think this. The, uh, the out this is really a question about the outgoing administration uh, and, my, and one's views about the outgoing administration. Uh, I uh, believe that, and you know, uh, it's with, with him in the room, it's a little embarrassing to say. Uh, <laughs> But I think the mayor's, uh, the, the mayor's tenure with the city has been, uh, been extraordinarily good for the city. Uh, when he came in uh, in 2000, the city's bureaucracy was, uh, was shocking. Uh, the union contracts associated with the provision of services were um, uh, unwieldy. 
uh, there could be a water main uh, there could be a water main going on at you know broken at two in the morning and you'd need to wait for the guy who's authorized to use the big wrench to come in from Dexter uh, this is was no way to run a railroad uh, and you know under the mayor's leadership this has uh, this has changed the city came, went down from a thousand employees to you know approximately 750 or so before the Great Recession we had cuts afterwards but nevertheless um, we if those changes had not occurred during the course of that tenure, uh, we'd have been in, in desperate, sta desperate straits. Uh, I think, too, that the, uh, the work downtown and, and the creation of the, uh, the, the D1, D2 zoning uh, regime for the downtown has poised the downtown for vitality and development. Uh, back in, uh, in 2000, before, you know, the downtown was more tenuous. Uh, right now, the downtown is thriving, and it is a uh, it is one of our primary competitive advantages. Uh, that sort of regularization of the process, I think, also is something that we uh, we can and ought to thank the mayor for. Uh, I think too that the city's focus on environmentalism uh, is something that has been. Uh, sort of in the DNA of the city for quite some time, but has really been institutionalized and made uh, something as you know, the ordinary course of business uh, under the current administration. I think these are, these are all good. Um, I think that there has been, and again, this is uncomfortable with him here, uh, I think there has been a, uh, a need for greater push to, to residents of, uh, of the things that Ann Arbor is doing. I think lots that Ann Arbor does is, uh, uh, is, is truly good uh, for the city, for its residents, for their quality of life in the long term, and that, uh, that not enough people sort of understand the complexity to it, uh, why potentially counterintuitive choices are made. Uh, there's a long game here, and it's for the best interests of the city. Uh, that level of communication, that push, that responsive, that push and dialogue is something that I think, if I were elected mayor, uh, that I would uh, truly want to focus on and work on. The mayor's been mayor for 14 years. If none of us disagreed with any of the decisions the council had made in those 14 years, well, then we weren't paying attention. Um, and we were, some of us, on council for the last seven years. Um, that, you took a year off, yes. So, um, it, we participated either on the side that won or the side that lost on those disputed issues. That's the way politics works. Do I think there are things that the city could do better? Absolutely, and one of those is and remains communication. I'm personally so frustrated with the city's website. It's not the mayor's responsibility to talk about the city's website. He doesn't do the website designing. But I have to tell you, it, the website may win awards, has won awards, and is still a terrible website to try to tell anybody how to navigate. I've been frustrated with the Office of Communication. It's really good at issuing press releases that don't tell anyone anything valuable. I would like to see that we're doing a good deal more in pushing information out to the public, but in the past seven years, that has changed so much that I'm, I can hardly complain. We have a much better process now for inviting the community in to talk about development than we did seven years ago or 10. We have a better process now for letting people know when their streets are going to be plowed or for that matter when they're going to be repaired. We've done a lot to improve our communication and it's still terrible. So communicating to the residents allows the residents to communicate back to us and that's what we need to improve in our community. Well, John, I'm going to say things I've already said to you before, so there won't be anything new. I've been, uh, Mayor John Heaps is probably the most ardent critic serving on city council, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but when we talk about the mayor's policies, I have already worked to uh, dismantle or, or change some of those policies over the years. I was one of the very strongest critics of the uh, Percent for Art Ordinance, uh, which did get amended with collaboration from my colleagues. I was the ardent um, opponent to countywide transit, 
okay, that again led into the face of, of Mayor Heafta's efforts to promote countywide transit. Um, I led the effort for the reform of the DDA, the DDA ordinance, um, against significant opposition among council members and John Heafta's supporters. I led part of the effort for uh, against the Fuller Road Station, which was nothing more than a parking structure with a bus stop for the University of Michigan. Um, I had been advocating the sale of the Y lot after 10 years, we finally were successful in selling the Y lot. And I know John was very supportive of that towards the end, but it took a long time to get that debt off our books. I promoted, I sponsored a resolution opposing the appointments of city staff to boards and commissions, particularly putting a city staff person on the Ann Arbor Transportation Authority. That's where it gets back into this issue of trust. A city staff person who doesn't live in the city, all right, should not be representing the citizens of Ann Arbor uh, when it comes to uh, putting a millage on the ballot. That's part of the distrust that I spoke about earlier. Um, but the biggest thing that will be changing, and one reason that I'm running, is that when you, change, when you go through a change in political power, all right, and he, back to my re, uh, reference to how I worked for seven elected officials for 12 years, the last two years of that were with, under a different supervisor, and that township supervisor got recalled because of the political power struggle that took place on, in, within the community. And that political power structure, uh, struggle is taking place here and now. We're going to watch it as part of this campaign and the part of the campaigns that take over the summer. Um, but it, it takes courage to stand up and to talk about these issues and to stay positive on the issues and stay away from the negativity about the character assassinations. If anything, that's probably one of the reasons that I'm running. Because we need to diversify our boards and commissions. We need people on the DDA that are thinking about the community, not just the downtown. And I think that's the important thing. We need people on the AATA that are thinking of the community, not people in Chelsea and Canton. And that's one of the things that I'm bringing to the table. And that's one of the things that probably scares most of John Heafta's supporters, that there could be change. And with that change will be diversification and a focus on our neighborhoods, because our neighborhoods have not been getting the attention that they need over these many years. Um, before I answer the question directly, I, I do want to acknowledge the component of this question that is about the, the outgoing leadership. And, and I do want to say that in the last 10 years, the economy has been tough for a lot of people, not just in Ann Arbor, but elsewhere. And I think the mayor really did lead us through those tough times, having to make some tough cuts with some quiet confidence that really was stabilizing for the community. Um, granted, we did have University of Michigan here also offering stable employment, so the feeling of that great recession was um, alleviated through that. Um, but I do think the mayor has done a great job in the last 10 years just leading the city um, with that quiet confidence. Um, that said, the one decision that I would, I guess the question of would I undo it or wish he hadn't made, and I'll be very candid, it was the veto of the repeal of the pedestrian crossing ordinance. Um, that was something that, um, again, I approached that issue and it, and, and it came back onto the table with the death of a University of Michigan student on Plymouth Road, um, right adjacent to Ward 2, again, um, city council members and I heard an outcry from the community about doing something about the pedestrian crossing ordinance. And I looked at both sides, I met with the opposition, and I really felt like we were on the same page in terms of the goals. Everyone wants pedestrians to be able to cross the street safely. Um, but I think what got commingled were issues of pedestrian rights with pedestrian safety. And when I look at the practical challenge of 70,000 people coming into Ann Arbor from outside Ann Arbor every day to work in Ann Arbor, um, moving traffic in and out quickly is, is imperative. But we have to be careful and pragmatic when, when we talk about pedestrian safety. And we need to look at other solutions other than requiring cars to stop for pedestrians waiting on the crosswalk. Um, so that would be one decision that I would like to revisit. Thank <laughs> you.
Well, thank you all very much for coming, and uh, thank you to the class and to our, our graduate student moderators. Students, I would like to note that uh, you have the perfect ability to participate here. Uh, if you're registered in Ann Arbor, if you haven't registered, you can do so. There's an election coming up in the first Tuesday in May. Uh, having to do with transit, uh, uh, something that I'm certainly a big supporter of and many are. Uh, I would suggest that if you're going to be out of town, it's very easy to get an absentee ballot. If you want to vote in the August primary, get an absentee ballot. You can do it from afar. If you're not going to be here, it's not that hard to participate. Uh, so many things are, are on the web nowadays that you're able to keep up with, uh, with events like this uh, just by tuning in. So again, thank you all very much uh, for coming. Um, I can say a, a word here that I am just really, really glad that uh, I, I don't have to run a campaign this summer. <laughs> uh, take care, and again, thank you.